This presentation will be about human resources. It's important to remember that managers in the recreation, parks, leisure, and sport need to be knowledgeable about various aspects of human resources and management practices related to human resources. Overall, there are three broad areas of functions and responsibilities for organizations in our field. The organization and delivery of programs or services, supervision and leadership program of our programs and services, and all business related duties to our sports programs, activities, facilities, and so forth. Human resource management is really dealing with how staff function within an organization. It supports the primary line of functions within the program delivery system, or as far as program development, delivery, evaluation, and same thing with facilities. Whether it's creating, distributing, or helping with financial services, successful operations of personnel determines the productivity of an organization. So again, we're looking at how the staff function within the organization and making sure we have them in a primary or a role where they can optimize what they're doing. In this context, we're going to look at people as our resource. So when we say human resources management, we're dealing with the people resources. So we're looking at things at position and classification, recruitment, selection, orientation. So the interview stuff, assignments, appraisals, and promotions. So what are they doing and how can we uh, appraise and promote that uh, good work? Um, compensation, so money, disciplinary action and grievances. So that's the negative aspects, you know, so you've got the appraisals and promotions on one side and then you've got the disciplinary action and grievances on the other. And then on to in-service training where how we develop employees personally and professionally to optimize uh, them as part of our organization. So let's look at position analysis and classification. There are three major components uh, in planning for personnel needs. We need to forecast personnel needs. So we're going to attempt to project future workforce needs. So that is either shrinkage due to the economy or due to improved practices or uh, growth due to the economy or due to other things, uh, maybe regulations or something like that, where we have to uh, get more people in there. Then we can look at job analysis of specific work activities. So look at specific jobs that need to be done. So breaking a position down into different tasks and jobs. And then we can look at specific talents and abilities required to, to do them. So Really what we want to do here is we've got a position broken into several jobs and tasks, right? And we want to group them to optimize the type of person that's going to fill that role. So if we have a couple of tasks under um, staff member A uh, and a couple of tasks under staff member B that are very similar, maybe we can combine that, uh, reclassify a position and have an optimal setup for an employee. So we've got a employee that has certain abilities that can really flourish under that new job classification description. Then we want to look at the development of sound, detailed plans to meet future personnel needs. So this is when we take the forecasting and the analysis and we really plan it out as far as what we'll need into the future, uh, as far as short-term future, long-term future, and very long-term future. An important little side note here is any agency that falls under the civil service requirements instituted in the 1880s um, needs to make sure that they have two categories of employees, classified permanent skilled and professional staff and unclassified political employees or elected officials. So really how I look at this is classified as somebody who interviews for the position with a certain credential skill set um, and it has that position regardless of political appointee elections or stuff, you know, anything like that. Whereas an unclassified or a political employee or elected official, if the election changes, um, let's say it's anywhere from the governor on down, there could be appointees um, that not do not necessarily interview with a skill set uh, for a position. They're appointed to a position. Um, and those people can be uh, let go or retained during the next election or appointee cycle, whereas classified employees um, 
in order to promote or uh, demote or uh, terminate them, you have to have, uh, you know, documentation and cause and all that kind of stuff. Okay, now we're going to look at recruitment selection and orientation. So the first thing we want to do when we're looking at hiring or bringing on new personnel is trying to locate qualified individuals. And that could be done in several different ways. You know, nowadays it's real popular to put an ad online through things like Indeed and other workforce sites that really market to certain people. However, in a lot of circumstances or a lot of cases, the people that you want to attract already have jobs and are not necessarily looking. Um, so you need to go to the recruitment versus just the open application stage. So really what we're looking at here is identifying the right people that you want to fill the position and trying to, in some way, recruit them to apply for the position. Once we've got them uh, in the pool of applicants, so to speak, you've got a good selection of people that are qualified, then we're going to screen them. So we're going to look at different applications and resumes, uh, CVs, whatever, it may, whatever information you have in front of you, we're going to screen them uh, to really eliminate the people that are not qualified or can, you know, cannot fill the position. And then from the rest of them, rank them to people we feel are the most qualified and would be the most successful, uh, on down. Now, this is always, always a little bit of a, um, it's a, it's a process that isn't perfect, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, you know, you may have a person ranked very high, uh, bring them in and they do not work out. You may have a person ranked really low. They come in and they fit in and they do a great job. So just know that it's not a perfect process. So overall, after we've get a, you know, kind of a basis of who we most prefer and are most qualified, so to speak, we start doing interviews and really interviews where you get to know the candidate a little bit better related to the profession, um, their goals, um, let them tell their story as far as where they got to where they are, what they've done professionally and stuff like that. And we're looking for, you know, similar goals. So we're looking for whether they're going to be in a, a small group or they're going to be part of a company, a department, whatever, you know, what are we, what are our goals? How do they fit in and what are their goals and how do we fit into those? So we want to make sure it's mutually uh, beneficial overall, right? Um, after we've, done our interviews and we've got uh, a few selected people that, you know, we think would really do a good job. Um, whether that's one to three to five people we think are really good candidates. We select a candidate we, we'd like to target as far as bringing on board. Now that's a process in and of itself to make the offer, uh, negotiate the circ, you know, the, the contract, if you will, and then get an agreement in place. And that could be a whole nother, discussion of how that would happen. Overall, we want to make sure that um, we get the right, we get the best person possible. Um, you know, sometimes the best person uh, is going to be uh, not available, not willing to come for whatever reason. Uh, maybe it's not a good fit on their side of the uh, coin, so to speak, but we're gonna get the best person possible. Next, we want to make sure we have orientation for new employees. And this is critical to get them up to speed as quickly as possible. So get them used to the culture, the rules and policies and their job as far as their task and their jobs and all that kind of thing. Um, and so some of this stuff can be done pretty quickly, right? As far as paperwork and meeting certain people and identifying certain things. And some of it's going to take a little bit longer. What I like to think about is think about an orientation process that's very quick and then a mentorship, a mentorship process that's going to be a little bit more ongoing and lengthy. So let's look at recruitment a little bit more for just a second. We can look at two main ways to recruit. We can do internal recruitment. So this is really a promotion from within. And then we could do something like an external recruitment where we're going to cultivate uh, different different external sources to locate potential employees, whether this is through advertisements, referrals, or professional services. Uh, some people call them headhunters or jobs, uh, job agencies and the like. 
during our screening process, what we'll want to do is make sure that people meet the minimum qualifications, uh, whatever they may be. And then we're looking for the best combination of uh, knowledge, skills, abilities, and experiences. But basically, the screening process really is just to make sure that the people meet minimum qualifications. So we, before we do the face-to-face -face interview, we want to make sure we've authenticated their academic cred credentials or certifications, um, licenses, whatever those uh, that may be applicable. We want to make sure that we facilitate and have completed the background check as far as uh, whatever that may look like for your position. Uh, some of them, sometimes those are a little bit more in-depth. And then we want to make sure we check references. So, you know, whether that's the, you know, a couple uh, on up to sometimes uh, jobs will ask for five to six references as well. We want to make sure we do all that uh, before we start the interview process to kind of, again, start that screening process early on. And then we have the formal interview, the face to face interaction with the potential candidates um, for the position, right? So what we're really doing is we're providing an exchange of relevant information. So we ask questions related to the job, decision making related to the job or the position, uh, experience within the profession and stuff like that. We want to look at job relevant knowledge, skills and abilities. So we're not going to try to do uh, anything related to personal stuff. Um, number one, there's laws against that. Number two, we want to make sure we're staying on topic. Everybody's time is uh, precious. It's a commodity, right? Um, so we're going to stay on topic as much as possible. Um, we want to provide the candidate with a realistic overview of what the position entails, uh, you know, whether that be um, travel, uh, work outside normal work hours, uh, physical demands, uh, things of that nature. And then we really want to create you know, an honest representation of our organization as far as culture, um, as far as, you know, uh, processes and stuff like that go. So we, we and I want to say we're going to, uh, you know, be too honest. We want to provide that in a positive light. Um, but we, you know, we want to stay away from the negative aspects, no doom and gloom. Um, you know, this is a, somebody you're trying to bring on board to help, you know, create the best workspace, uh, you know, possible. So you want to make sure that everything is uh, very positive overall. So make sure that your screening and interview process follows all legal guidelines. And then you move to what is our top person? What's our best candidate, so to speak? And we want to make sure that we're choosing the best candidate for our, not just the position, but the culture and the environment as well. And again, orientation is more of a welcoming to the organization. We want to familiarize the new employee with our practices, procedures, our culture, um, the vibe, if you will, um, everything that's the, the main stuff. And then we want to do stuff like onboarding where we fill out documents and whatnot. Okay, so let's move on to assignments, appraisals, and promotions. Remember that efficient and effective organizations carry out the organization's mission and goals. We want to make sure we assign the right people to the right job task. With that, we want to make sure we evaluate how employees are carrying out their assigned jobs and tasks, and we want to promote individuals into new responsibilities and job duties as the organization involves. We to promote the right individuals. So when we talk about assignment of employees, we really want to make sure that we're finding the best way to utilize their different skills, uh, knowledge, and experiences, right? And that may change over time due to uh, the organization changing, due to the economy changing, due to the uh, social situation changing, whatever the, may, the factor may be. The, the, the skills needed may change and the, the personality needed may change depending on whatever is going on. It also may include, you know, making sure that we're optimizing this may include uh, moving an individual from one position to another. And this is not a reflection of a good or a bad job. It's just a reflection of the, the, the changing of what is needed for positions uh, or within positions, right? So overall, organizations, uh, effective use of human resources by integrating individual abilities and organizational needs needs to be optimized. So when we talk about effective use, we're talking about optimizing who we have and how we can uh, get the best uh, out of our staff and get the best outcomes for our organization. We do want to do periodic performance appraisals, and this is going to ensure that we're running as effectively and efficiently as possible. We want to provide the manager with the information to guide decision-making regarding promotions, training, and long-range planning. 
So performance appraisals fall under that. And performance appraisal techniques will aid in developmental training programs. So one thing that we can notice is um, when we see certain trends within our appraisals, we can uh, offer in-service or in-service training professionally or personally that would kind of guide, um, you know, to overcome some of the weaknesses or some of the things we've found as far as speed bumps or potholes or whatnot. And then also it helps employees better understand their individual strengths and weaknesses. So beyond what we may provide as an organization for training, somebody can, you know, find out, you know, through a performance appraisal, things they need to work on or things that they should really, uh, understand that it's a strength or whatnot, uh, however you may look at that, and really do some, uh, you know, introspection as to how they can better themselves uh, personally and professionally. There are really two ways that performance appraisals really affect the long-term planning of an organization. So we have a lot of short-term things that we try to overcome through it, but long-term, it allows us to identify potential problem areas and take corrective action for the long-term. So we can migrate resources to address problem areas, or we can, you know, to so we're shifting resources from one place to another, or we can shift personnel from from one place to another. Um, so, and that's what the other part of it is: is we can, you know, these performance appraisals helps us identify individuals that may have promise for the future, or vice versa, right? And we'll talk about that here in a second. So, who can we identify that's going to have the potential to uh, do other things or bigger things or so on and so forth. And I just wanted to look at a couple of different performance appraisal techniques here. We're not going to go into these in any depth, um, but we can look at rating scales. So uh, rating an individual based on different factors. Um, we can look at, um, look at management by objectives where we identify objectives and rate from there. Uh, force distribution, whether that's uh, individual with, uh, we have, uh, different areas and we distribute or we rank them, um, per individual, or if we look at, uh, a staff as a whole and, you know, who's the top at this and who's the bottom at that and so on and so forth. But just know that there's a wide range of performance appraisal techniques out there and you need to look at what may best suit the organization or agency that you're working with. Uh, so another way to look at this is conducting evaluation interviews. And this is really a conversation between a supervisor and employee. So this is an, an open discussion of the evaluation, right, or the um, performance appraisal. It's an opportunity for employees to receive the feedback um, and identify things that they can improve. Um, and it helps them improve themselves versus the company or agency doing the professional development, right? So overall, we're looking at a, an exchange of information related to the performance appraisal. Um, and, it, and overall, it, you know, if done well, these can be very effective at helping uh, correct a lot of minor things that people just may, may or may not be aware of. Let's talk about promotions for a second. And this is really the advancement of the employees that are already in place. So I, and I really believe an organization should try to promote individuals from within They've got the institutional knowledge, they've got the commitment and the understanding of the organization uh, and so on and so forth. This is, this is not a way, this is not to say that you can't bring somebody in from the outside or an external person and do a good job. But if we've got the internal resources to do it, um, number one, uh, you're going to, I think you're going to have a better organization as far as, um, you know, utilizing the resources you already have, and then you're going to use less resources on recruiting, onboarding, and all that. Really, there's two factors to be considered if you're talking about promotion of an individual. The first one's merit. Um, does it does the person deserve the opportunity? As far as you know, have they uh, done well in the position? Have they shown the professional uh, signs as far as uh, knowledge, skills, and abilities to be successful in the new position? And overall, um, have they done a good job um, in a roundabout way with the company or organization? And then we can also look at seniority. You know, and a lot of times um, you might have somebody that's uh, just, you know, two people are equally qualified and probably could both do a good job and one person's been there longer. Um, so we can look that, at that as an option as well. Then we come to the old compensation discussion. So... 
Overall, it's important to remember that people are motivated both intrinsically and extrinsically. So, and, and pay compensation is an extrinsic motivation. So equitable pay programs must be established and administered. What we're looking at here is looking at fair and just pay practices. And this has come to be a, a more relevant issue recently is the best way to put it regarding a whole host of factors. But what you want to do is have an established guideline and administer it appropriately. Um, this may involve structuring uh, of objective wage systems and merit programs. So if we're looking at like classifying it certain ways, this job is classified under this pay scale, uh, so on and so forth. And then looking at merit programs, whether it's um, one-time uh, payments for uh, jobs well done, or overall it's a, um, a compensation adjustment as far as hourly or salary wages increased. Um, the other way we can look at, uh, compensation is looking at stuff like fringe benefits. Uh, so this is things like paid vacations, holidays, health insurance, and so on and so forth. You know, uh, there's a lot of different things we could put into that category. Um, but that's also a type of compensation. Time off is another one. Um, so, you know, we think about, uh, teachers, you know, you know, they have a certain expectation of, you know, typical school year, and then they have certain, um, uh, times and freedoms during other parts of the year. Um, and that's part of the compensation package overall. So in general, we're going to look at compensation as a big umbrella, but overall we want to make sure we administer our compensation philosophy, uh, fairly and equitably across the board. All right. To summarize here, we're going to look at human resources overall being involved with the acquisition, uh, of new employees, um, they deal with work relationships as far as retention and development of employees. We're going to look at training of employees based on various factors. And really, we're going to look at human resource management is overall the management of the people of the organization. That concludes our presentation on human resources.